It is 2.20. We'll start this off. Hi, my name is Doug Sherman. I'm moderating today's talk. It's transitioning to the cloud for a pipeline developer. This is, for those that know me, near and dear to my heart. I come from uh, uh, DreamWorks Animation, and we're also working with NBC Universal. So we're, we're talking about cloud just about every day. This is a really good talk. We've got four outstanding people, all interesting things. I, I nodded at each one of them. I, I can't wait to hear as much as you guys <laughs> to see. I got a little bit of sneak preview. I'll give you a, a rundown. We're going to start with uh, Justin Marshall. He's principal engineer at Animal Logic. Uh, he's going to talk about transparency of cloud technology in the pipeline. Basically, do your users see it? Is it good they see it? Are the resources good to be noting or are they sort of transparent in the background? We have Matt Mazzoli. Uh, he's a director of product at New Technologies at Foundry. He's going to talk about porting tools over to the cloud. He's got obviously a lot of experience in that working at Foundry. So good stuff there. We have Natasha Kelker, software defined workflow architect at Jellyfish Pictures. She's going to talk a little bit about just, you know, if you're interested in becoming a pipeline developer uh, working in this space, some things to think about in writing your first services and, and some just good tips all around. And then the conclusion will be uh, Francois Lavelle, Director of Engineering at Conductor Technologies. He's going to write a, uh, talk a little bit about uh, infrastructure, but doing it as code and, and all the kind of advantages you can get with that. So each person is going to get 10 minutes. They're going to go one after next. Think of questions you want to ask, because at the end, we're going to have some time. We're going to be able to ask any of the people on this panel any sort of questions you want, and I'll help out with that. I'll pop in at the end. So with that, let me hand it off to Justin. All right, let me get uh, my screen sharing going. You're seeing that okay? So yeah, hi, uh, I'm Justin. I'm a principal engineer at Animal Logic. Um, been there for quite a while. Don't ask my age in animal years. Uh, it started, years started with a one when I started there. So it's a bit of a while ago now. Uh, my role there at the moment is focusing on Animal Logic's uh, integration, uh, migration to the cloud. And um, uh, before I talk about that in too much detail, I might just give you a quick look at what we've been up to recently. of things they can do that you don't know about a lot of things so uh the problem that i want to talk about today is uh it's you know we start from first principles uh i won't even need to justify this we want to be cloud native that's that's what we need um and we'd like to use our current pipeline um at animal logic certainly we like our pipeline as it is our current pipeline is not cloud native though so what are we going to do about that? Your journey to the cloud is no doubt going to begin with questions. And one of the most important questions you can ask yourself is how much change can we all tolerate at once? And answering that question depends a bit on how formal your pipeline is. And by formal, I mean, if you have a, a fairly informal pipeline, you're probably uh, adapting your processes around your tools and workflows. Um, uh, you know, if you need a new file format, you're going to produce a step in your process that actually produces that file format. Um, that makes you probably quite agile. You already got fairly dynamic processes and you can change things often enough without uh, totally breaking production. On the formal uh, end of the spectrum, you are probably all, uh, instead of adapting your process to fit the tools, you're adapting the tools to fit the processes. You're extending them, automating them, writing plugins, that sort of stuff. Uh, you probably get your efficiency from automation. Uh, your processes are repeatable. 
and you have the option to change things under the hood in some cases uh, to keep your artist impact low when you need to change your pipeline. When it comes to transitioning to the cloud, you're going to find there's a bit of a spectrum in terms of how you can get there. At one end, you've got lift and shift. That's where you're just picking up what you've got, running it in the cloud. That's great, low, low impact. At the other end, new cloud native pipeline, a nice uh, shiny thing that everybody loves building new pipelines all the time. So um, in reality, of course, you probably will land somewhere in between uh, where some things will be lifted and shifted and other things will be uh, cloud native. There are pros and cons of each, of course. Uh, lift and shift uh, has benefits that, um, uh, you know, it's very transparent. You're pretty much picking up what you have and running it in the cloud instead of on-prem. Uh, doesn't really need to change your pipeline much or perhaps at all. Um, and it will give you a lot of ex team experience uh, in uh, you know, setting up your network and all of the things that you would have to do anyway. So it's good in those regards. Um, of course, there's some concerns. You may not be taking the best advantage of the cost uh, opportunities in the cloud if you're just running everything all the time, like you did on-prem, you're not turning it off all the time when you don't need it. Um, and a slightly more insidious problem that we've, uh, we've been worrying about at Animal is the it just works trap. We picked everything up, we put it in the cloud and it runs and it works, so just leave it alone. Um, and that you haven't necessarily optimized it or, or taken advantage or really gone as far as you could have, or even as far as you wanted. Cloud native, on the other hand, um, you're starting how you want to finish. You're not building transitionary temporary stuff you're going to throw away. You're taking advantage of uh, cost opportunities and efficiency early on. Uh, of course, that's going to have a greater impact on your pipeline though. Um, and the, the insidious trap on this side is the greenfield one where you end up biting off more than you can chew um, and spending a lot of time. So there's some risks, risks in uh, both areas. And it's going to be up to you to choose how transparent uh, your facility is. Um, where are you going to set that dial? And a way to, to gauge that for yourself is to ask yourself some questions. Does your pipeline work? If it's working well, you're probably going to be really targeting something pretty transparent because you don't want to upset that apple cart. If your pipeline is not that efficient, your artists are complaining, maybe you're looking for an opportunity already uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to change things and a cloud native pipeline might be just the ticket. If your technology is already modern or if you're already pretty agile, you might even be in a position where it's easier for you to change things to the cloud than uh, you know, to, to pick them up uh, and move them across anyway. So once you've set that dial, um, you're going to be setting that on a, um, uh, at a, uh, uh, sorry, on a few key areas. Um, render and workstations I won't talk about today uh, because they're almost easy. And in any case, they generally depend on storage. It's a really big one. Um, this is the thing that is going to, uh, to plague you a bit as you're, as you're moving to the cloud. Um, you know, everybody thinks the, the cloud has all this object storage and it's amazing, but can you really use that in production? Um, do you need a global namespace? Do your files all have to have exactly the same paths or do you have a, an asset resolver that you can use to uh, redirect from more generic URIs to, to uh, dynamically generated file paths? Do your artists even still care about file paths? Here we are in 2021, we're all, all worrying about file names. Um, maybe you can use this as an opportunity to break away from that a little bit. And what's your cross-region um, situation? How are you uh, expecting your artists to collaborate across, uh, across different uh, geographical regions? Uh, and what impact is that going to have on your performance, cost, um, and replication? So Animal's journey, um, we are hybrid cloud rendering now. We have been for some time. Uh, we've just got uh, machines running over a fat pipe. Um, storage is the next thing because, of course, we can only uh, run so many render nodes over a fat pipe back to on-prem. Um, and uh, we are starting to move towards rack mount workstations on-prem and uh, thin clients so that uh, I think that's going to put us in a really good position to move to, um, uh, to cloud workstations as soon as the, the storage problem is solved. We are still tethered for lots of workflows. Um, but uh, the goal is to uh, start a show uh, in 2023 that is going to be entirely cloud uh, driven. We don't know what that show is yet, but um, uh, we will pick one as we get closer to the date. And we've set our dial pretty high. We, we, our pipeline is in a good shape um, and we would like to uh, preserve as much of it as we can while augmenting it with cloud rather than uh, you know, ripping it out and replacing it with a new one. And the goal will be for the majority of our pipeline to be cloud native. Um, so yeah, I know there were lots of questions there more than answers, but um, I hope that that helps you in your journey to the cloud. Thanks.
Uh, howdy, I'm up next. Um, my name's uh, Matt Masrol. I'm with Foundry, the Director of Product for New Technology. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some things we learned launching a cloud service, which we operated for a period of time, and uh, some of our thoughts on uh, what important considerations are for moving to cloud and a little bit about what we think the uh, future is going to look like. So um, I'll, I'll run down uh, essentially um, Maz's cheat sheet uh, for the cloud. Um, first off, um, a lot of things that uh, Justin just said in his presentation uh, really resonate uh, with the way we see cloud in Foundry, especially around storage being uh, something that people often underestimate uh, how complicated it is to manage storage in the cloud because it's one of the things that's really the, the most different. You, know, you can sort of lift and shift compute, but lifting and shifting storage really uh, ends up with uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of issues. So uh, we'll touch on that and a bunch of other things. So the basics, uh, basic stuff around cloud, you've got workstations, rendering data, uh, same things Justin mentioned. Uh, you, know, you want to consider your CPU, GPU right sizing, uh, how you remote into these things. You want to know whether you have, uh, you know, hub and spoke model around your studio, uh, where people remote into studio versus going cloud. Um, you know, moving to cloud really has that advantage of getting more geographic scale. Uh, rendering, it's really about orchestration, uh, provisioning, uh, you know, provisioning elastic uh, rendering resources. And there is storage involved in rendering where you do have to move things to render nodes. But if you're in a pure cloud environment, that actually becomes a lot more transparent. And data, data is obviously where things get more complicated. You've got lots of different types of data in the cloud, uh, whereas you know, in a traditional studio model, things can be much flatter. Um, but to talk more, uh, more strategically about uh, moving to cloud and how applications sort of migrate to the cloud and where they, uh, you know, where there's still a lot of gaps that need to be filled. Um, I use the model of uh, cost, security, and performance. So I'll touch on each of those individually. Um, so cost really is uh, kind of the first thing that people often, you know, think of when you go to cloud, like, oh boy, you know, it's going to be expensive or cost could be hard to manage. Um, really, when you move to cloud and you're thinking about cost as part of your, your strategy, um, you really have to start thinking differently about cost. It's not so much that things are more expensive or less expensive, it's just you have to think along how uh, cost tracks usage versus it's something that's upfront that you sort of depreciate. So um, what you're doing today, if you have an on-prem studio, is you're paying for what you're not using, whereas in the cloud, you're paying for what you are using. And cloud providers don't make costs easy to understand. And this is really unfortunate. Like if you ever try to decode what a certain infrastructure will cost and going to cloud providers uh, pricing page, very difficult, uh, can be very challenging to decode all of that. So it takes time. Um, you know, the advice there is really just take your time to understand cost model and run small scale experiments and try to figure out what things will cost on a small scale. And then you can more easily project that out uh, to a wider scale, and it should uh, it should follow uh, logically. Uh, but one of the things you know, Justin mentioned briefly in his presentation was you know, it, it's really not just about cost; it's also about people's behavior. Uh, if people are turning things on and just leaving them on, that's you know, extra cost that maybe you hadn't accounted for. You know, people uh, need to interact with cloud resources sometimes differently than they interact with this traditional studio pipeline. You know, uh, when you have potentially infinite elastic resources, well, how do you actually control people's uh, behavior patterns around that when previously they've had scarce resources that were on premise? Um, security. So security to me is it's a spectrum disorder. Uh, you know, security is not like oh, it's secure or it's not secure. It's really a gradient. Um, and when you're looking at security in the cloud, the main thing to understand is what's called the shared responsibility model. This is something Amazon talks about a lot. Um, you kind of think of it as, you know, your cloud provider, make sure they give you a safe car, but you're responsible for driving it car, uh, properly and not getting in an accident. So, um, you know, you really need to know how to use the cloud in a way that's secure and you don't really uh, have, uh, you know, like a guarantee that your cloud provider is going to secure your pipeline for you. You have to do that, which means, you know, cloud security is really about people uh, and it's a lot less about process and technology. So processes help, technology helps. 
but you really need to invest in the skills and the understanding around security. Um, and for content creation apps, if you're bringing DCC tools in, you know, just, just know there isn't really like a TPM program for those, like there is for studio infrastructure. Uh, there isn't like a single app being blessed, like, oh, that's a secure app. Uh, it's really about the perimeter. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind, make sure you've secured the perimeter around your, your applications. Um, and one thing that I always find is interesting when people talk about the moving to the cloud, they come to Foundry and they say, hey, is your Foundry application secure in the cloud? And you know, either saying yes or saying no is a lie, uh, because you know a standard uh, standard for secure really comes from what you're doing uh, and what your pipeline looks like and how you're uh, using cloud resources and how they're configured. So um, you know, security is a is a subtle and deep conversation. It's one you should have with your vendors um, with that knowledge. Um, let's see, oh, there you go. Um, performance. Uh, sadly, most content creation tools out there are not optimized for the cloud yet. Um, one of the concepts in the cloud that's really important is this idea of horizontal versus vertical scaling. So mostly what we do with on-prem resources is we scale them vertically. You go from uh, one computer to a bigger computer and that bigger computer lets one person do more. Uh, the concept of the cloud is really around horizontal scaling. You have lots and lots of computers, but they had need to be able to divide a workload up amongst them and coordinate and orchestrate those workloads. And sadly, a lot of content creation tools today are really designed around one box, one big GPU, one big processor. Um, and you know we're only now slowly starting to build out cloud native or horizontally scalable compute backends in a lot of architectures and content creation tools. So um, you know that's something to really think about is how can you take advantage of the superpower of the cloud, which is horizontal scaling in your workloads. Uh, and understand performance bottlenecks. So networking is an obvious one, um, you know, virtual machine sizes, that type of thing. But never underestimate the performance bottlenecks of storage. You really need to measure a lot when it comes to storage. And it's not a simple equation because uh, the key to uh, getting good performance of storage is tiering. Um, and you know, Justin uh, alluded to this, but one of the things uh, you know, most cloud performance problems are because of bad storage tiering architectures. And this is what we've seen in the wild is, you know, storage as a bottleneck is usually because you've gone and said, like, oh, we'll throw all this stuff into, you know, object storage and just read right off of that. Well, that has huge uh, performance bottlenecks and it's not really, you know, the right way for to, for to access data for all kinds of workloads generally. So you want to be able to add layers of tiering and caching in order to be able to get the right a uh, storage system connect it to the right uh, things that are uh, computing or processing or where people are actually using the data. And that's where you really want to put a lot of thinking because that's usually where your performance bottlenecks will arrive. So a couple other things to think about. Um, this is, sounds like a boring one, but it's actually a really big uh, bugbear with moving to cloud is licensing. Uh, licensing technology for most apps is pretty antiquated. Uh, it's not typically usage-based uh, rendering. You can get usage-based rendering. Uh, you know, Francois here is with Conductor where you can get really great usage-based rendering. And don't forget about your plugins. Your plugins are also using 1990s licensing technology. Um, there's a little chart here. I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but there's all these different types of licensing technologies that all kind of have uh, different issues. You know, moving to a more sophisticated licensing model is really the key for unlocking not just the ease of use of moving in and out of the cloud and hybrid scenarios, making licensing work well in the cloud, but also for horizontally scaling workloads so that licensing is not an issue when you want to scale the licensing scales with you. Uh, you know, my hot take is licensing tech is one of the big things holding back cloud adoption uh, because the business model just kind of gets in the way. Uh, and I think that's a big thing that, you know, you'll see a lot of change of in the future from uh, a lot of application vendors. Um, do it yourself versus uh, using a platform as a service. You know, some folks here are on the journey building their own cloud platforms or using cloud uh, with raw materials from cloud providers. The great thing is that you've also got a lot of out of the box cloud solutions. I've named a few here. There are many more. Some of them are really great. Um, understand where you need flexibility and where you need control. If you're looking for ease of use and you don't really want to go and tune everything yourself, Maybe platform as a service is the way you want to go. But if you want to go deep and build your own cloud, your own cloud uh, pipeline, then you know take the time to understand capability and limitations of all the raw material you want to use, and watch out for the licensing gotchas. 
So platform as a service for m and &E is still really early stage, but I think these are getting better and better. A lot of these, you know, studio in the cloud services are fairly new. Uh, there's a lot of slick marketing. Some of them are really great. Take the time to learn uh, where you want to use, uh, you know, all in one solutions versus build your own. And the future, um, I think the future is uh, everything is launched in ephemeral containers and microservices. Uh, I think this idea that you'll have these big executables running on monolithic machines will uh, be something that fades away more and more. I think applications will be architected to be horizontally scalable, which lends itself to uh, microservices and kind of ephemeral. Uh, compute workloads that can pop up and disappear as needed. That unlocks horizontal scaling, which is really one of the superpowers of the cloud. Uh, render farms will die. You know, this idea that you have a fixed amount of rendering resources uh, just doesn't become the way we want to work because it limits creativity and it limits the potential for bringing compute to bear on creative tasks. Uh, and you'll see content creation tools being fundamentally re-architected in their backends for the cloud. Uh, and everything being intelligently encapsulated and tiered uh, between cloud and on-prem, data, compute, people, context, making everything declarative and repeatable uh, and encapsulated is a big advantage of the cloud. A lot of the reason to build a pipeline around the cloud is so that you can uh, deploy it anywhere and get it to people anywhere in the world. So making it uh, you know, completely data-driven, which I'm sure Francois will talk about a lot more, is really you know, the, the future. And the, in the future, according to Maz, licensing doesn't suck. It'll be universal, usage-based, elastic, infrastructure agnostic, and give you the power of being able to audit and secure uh, who's using what within your, your pipeline infrastructure. So when do we get there? Um, ideally, as soon as possible. And I think what's really great is um, you know, a lot of companies and uh, customers are all focusing on trying to build out uh, all of the gaps uh, that need to be filled to get us to um, the future. And um, that's it for me. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Natasha Kirkar. I am a software architect at uh, Jellyfish Pictures here in London. Um, today, I'm just going to give you an introduction to services. So the goal of sort of the next 10 minutes is to um, hopefully give you a starting point if you're thinking of uh, writing your first service. So there's lots of things to consider uh, when writing um, a service, but I thought instead of going through like each of these points and going over the theory, let's just look at a practical example. So say you have, you know, you have a new database and you want to write uh, an API for, uh, for this database. Now you could write this as a shared library, but there are drawbacks to writing this as a shared library. You may not know what language your client application is written in, um, and you want this API to probably be a common interface uh, for all your client applications. Um, you also probably don't want to recompile uh, a client application every time there's a change to the API. Um, and you might want to scale the API independently of your applications. So instead of writing this as a shared library, let's just write this as, as a service. Um, so when, we're, when thinking of writing a service, you also want to think of what protocol you want to use, uh, because that's going to have an, have an impact on the rest, rest of your technology stack. Um, so you could use RPC, gRPC, or REST. Um, there's pros and cons for all of these, and I highly recommend you actually read up on the architectural uh, styles before starting uh, to design your service. But generally, uh, RPC-based APIs are great for actions. So something like send message, do something sort of thing. Uh, gRPC is uh, an RPC implementation that uses HTTP 2.0 as uh, the underlying protocol. It is both faster and, and, and more efficient uh, than RPC and REST. And then REST is probably the most common uh, and, and widely known uh, protocol. Uh, and it's great if you are making sort of CRUD actions available on your, on your data. Um, for the purpose of this example, let's say we are building a REST API. Um, so while REST is actually 
quite easy to build. Designing a good REST API can actually be difficult. As programmers, we tend to think in terms of procedures and functions. So designing like resources or entities can be difficult. Uh, by following the open API specification, you can actually get around a lot of the drawbacks of traditional REST APIs. So in our example, we'll use open API or Swagger uh, to design our uh, REST interface. Swagger actually provides like a really nice online editor uh, if you want to build and validate uh, your API without actually writing uh, a single line of code. Um, and then if you're using a, if you're actually writing a Python web service, I also recommend looking up like the connection library. Um, it is basically built on top of Flask and uh, it, it auto-magically sort of handles the HTTP requests that are defined using OpenAPI. Great, so we've got our Python web service. Uh, now you need to build a web server to actually serve this application. Um, again, there's lots of options here. You could use Gunicon or Gunicon, however you pronounce that, MicroWiski, uh, Tornado, say we go with Gunicon. Um, and in this example, maybe you just create like a system D unit that starts up um, and, you know, whenever your server boots up and then serves your Flask application on a particular port. At this point, uh, you could probably have clients connecting to your uh, application and accessing the database. Uh, you could stop here, but say your service gets really popular. And now you've got lots of clients connecting to your service to the point where uh, maybe you start seeing uh, performance issues. So what, what do you do? Maybe you have you start running multiple instances of your service and you start running them on different ports. Um, but how do you communicate those ports to your client? How do you actually manage uh, the load across your services? You probably need a load balancer. Um, again, you could use Nginx, you could use HProxy. In this example, we use an Nginx, also because the Nginx is actually more than a load balancer. Uh, you can use it as a reverse proxy um, or an HTTP cache, uh, which can significantly improve the performance of your application. You can also enable TLS and provide a secure endpoint for all of your requests. Great, so now let's just talk a bit about the deployment strategy. So where is this running? Um, you could have all of this running on a single physical node or VM. Uh, that could be running maybe on premise, maybe in a data center. It could be running in the cloud. It doesn't really matter. Um, but there are problems with everything running on a single host. You're going to run into resource limitations. Um, it's also really hard to monitor uh, each of these processes and, and, and uh, generally debug. So uh, instead, one deployment strategy to use is to actually have a service for VM. VMs are pretty easy to spin up. Uh, they, you can set resource limitations on a VM. Um, and uh, it's quite easy to scale. On the downside, building a VM is actually quite slow. And depending on how your studio is structured, you probably have to work with your infrastructure team uh, to provision new VMs for you know, new service instances. So you could think of using containers at this point. Um, and you could have a container per service per service instance. Um, this is great, you know, containers, they encapsulate your entire technology stack. Uh, you can set resource limits. Uh, you can also have multiple containers running on a single VM. Uh, and they're fast to build and start. On the flip side, you will actually need some sort of infrastructure now to manage all of these containers. So if, you're sing if it's a single service and if you're using Docker, you could probably get away with maybe using something like Docker Compose on a single VM, but you'll still need to set up like a container registry uh, because you probably don't want to use the, the public uh, container registry. Uh, and as your service grows uh, across multiple VMs, or if you have more services running across multiple VMs, you might want to start thinking about how you want to manage all of these containers across all of these VMs. That's where Kubernetes comes in. So Kubernetes is an open source platform for managing containerized workflow, uh, workloads and services. Now, regardless of the deployment strategy, one thing you definitely should think about is monitoring. Um, because if there's one thing we you know about technology is that technology, you know, 
things fail. Uh, the more confidence you have, the more chances of things failing. Um, and without monitoring, you're essentially just flying blind and it's going to be really hard to pinpoint where, um, where the problem or where the failure is. So as we can see, um, depending on what you want to do, things can get pretty complex fairly quickly. Um, so to conclude, I just wanted to go over some of the lessons that I've learned over um, sort of the last four years working with distributed systems. Um, microservices architecture is extremely powerful. It can allow your studio to scale up or down on demand. Um, you know, you're no longer tied to a specific language or even to your studio's legacy code base. Uh, you can use modern technologies and standards to build, test, deploy services. But as I said before, um, every component that you add adds in a layer of complexity. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something to keep in mind um, that whenever you add another component, make sure you can justify why you're adding it in and not because it's just it's like the cool new tool to try and use. Um, there's also a large number of open source uh, projects that are available. So unless you have very specific needs, you probably don't need to build your own. Um, it's, this especially goes for like Kubernetes uh, clusters. Unless you have like a really large team of engineers or a, or a death wish, um, I, I've, I really don't recommend building uh, your own on-premise Kubernetes cluster. Uh, which brings me to my next point. Uh, services fail, and they love to fail in the middle of the night. Uh, think about on-call support right from the beginning once you start decide when you decide to start writing services. Um, you don't want to be the person who gets called every single time in the middle of the night when something fails. Um, and that actually leads me to my last point, which is this isn't really about one or two engineers building something cool. Um, it's about changing studio culture to actually support uh, cloud-based workflows. And this means providing technology teams with training, headcount, support infrastructure, maybe if you're lucky some time, um, but without that, it's actually really hard to be successful and to you know, successfully transition to the cloud-based workflows. Um, and that's all that I had. I just want to plug in that we're hiring at Jellyfish Pictures for Pipeline developers. Um, we're based in London, but you don't have to be. Uh, we are hiring for fully remote positions as well. So please um, get in touch with me if you're interested. And thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Francois Labelle, and I'm the director of engineering at Conductor, where my team is building the largest and most scalable render farm entirely in the cloud, running on both AWS and Google Cloud. Um, my presentation will cover what is infrastructure as code, um, why is it relevant, what tools are the most popular, and why should you pick one over another? And finally, I will go over some of the industry's best practices that are helpful to know during your migration to the modern DevOps practice that is infrastructure as code. What is infrastructure as code? Per Wikipedia, infrastructure as code or IAC is a process of managing and provisioning computer data centers through machine readable definition files rather than physical hardware configuration or interactive configuration tools. Or in simpler words, infrastructure as code lets you define your data center infrastructure in the form of configuration files rather than using GUI, GUI interfaces or manually editing infrastructure settings to configure your data center resources. Infrastructure as code can be used to define resources such as a load balancer, uh, a Kubernetes cluster, for example, uh, application secrets, virtual machines, DNS records, site-to-site -site VPN between on-prem and cloud, uh, serverless functions, et cetera. That infrastructure as code is typically versioned in a source control repository such as Git, and it is typically defined as text file that can be edited from any text editor or IDE. This means that the tools used to help you keep your application source code consistent with your code style and free from errors, such as linters, are also available for configuration files of infrastructure as code. 
In addition, you can generate diffs of your configuration files to look for changes since a given point in time, just like you would do with your application source code. That is extremely powerful. Infrastructure as code applies to on-prem and cloud resources and can also be used with bare metal machines uh, or virtual machines. This presentation will focus on managing cloud infrastructure. Why is infrastructure as code relevant? Um, this is a great snippet from Microsoft. And in a nutshell, it says that infrastructure as code evolved from a real challenge in production environments. The challenge is that cloud environments, for example, development and staging environments, tend to drift from the production environment over time unless configuration of the infrastructure is tracked and managed through a single source of truth. Without a single source of truth for your infrastructure configuration, it's not a question of whether your cloud environment drifts from its expected state. It's a question of when it does. Lastly, a core property of infrastructure as code is idempotence. Idempotence in a context of infrastructure as code means that applying a co configuration change to your environment will always leave the environment in a functional state. And in the case of errors when applying the, the changes, your environment will be restored to its previous, uh, previously known functional state. More specifically, some common problem, problems solved by infrastructure as code are uh, reduced risks. By having a single source of truth define your infrastructure in a version source control, every change has to go through the source control and ideally a pull request and code review process as well, where knowledge can be exchanged and errors can get caught early. This also helps prevent a slew of common issues caused by ad hoc changes to infrastructure uh, raise your hand if that never happened to you. Um, a side effect from writing your infrastructure as code is also that your infrastructure becomes uh, self-documenting because um, you have the text file in place that uh, def define your infrastructure that can be searched and uh, indexed. Uh, empower your application developers. Infrastructure as code empowers developers to define the infrastructure components of their applications independently from infrastructure teams. Depending on the structure of the organization, this can greatly increase the velocity of your development teams by giving them more autonomy and ownership to complete their projects. Stable on-demand environments. Development, staging, test, and testing environments can be synchronized automatically and additional environments can be created on-demand to mirror the production environment. This allows developers to work in isolation from other developers and environments to validate the infrastructure configuration and to prevent common deployment issues. This can be done as a manual step or it can be part of your continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline and QA processes. Accountability. Since the infrastructure as code configuration can be version, ver can be version in source control and, and it should, uh, changes are tracked in the commit history and consequently the configuration can be audited to determine since when a problemat problematic configuration change was last applied. For example, using a third party service such as Harness, you could set up automatic rollbacks if memory usage of your database server increased unexpectedly after applying a configuration change to your database server. Um, that thing is extremely powerful. Um, disaster recovery, zones and regions of cloud providers go down or they run out of resources to rent. It, it does happen, trust, trust me. Um, with infrastructure as code, spinning up resources in another cloud zone to mitigate the impact of a cloud provider's outage on your business is typically a, a trivial task. Um, these are just a few of the advantages of defining your infrastructure as code. There are a number of competing tools available in the market, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. That being said, one of your first considerations when choosing a tool should be whether your infrastructure is better served by a pull or push model. The pull model is where infrastructure requests its configuration from a configuration server. For example, a virtual machine would request its expected configuration after the operating system boots using a pre-installed agent and would apply the configuration onto itself until its state matches the expected configuration. A push model, on the other hand, is where you have a configuration server applying configuration to your virtual machines and querying APIs to provision resources. For example, Terraform, a tool maintained by HashiCorp, prepares an execution plan by, pre by comparing the expected configuration to the actual infrastructure configuration in your environment. That execution plan can then be applied onto the environment by calling the proper APIs to provision the required infrastructure. Should the execution plan fail to apply completely, Terraform will automatically roll back its changes to the previously known working snapshot of your infrastructure. 
Another important consideration is whether environment of choice, for example, AWS or Google Cloud and or on-prem are supported as first-class citizens by the tool. Um, otherwise, you might find yourself having to work around limitations of your tool instead of doing more productive work. One such example is CloudFormation, which is built by AWS and can only manage as AWS resources. Whether you're starting from scratch or if you already have components of infrastructure as code in place, there are a few concepts which apply to most tools available today. That being said, these specifically apply to Terraform because that's where most of my experience with infrastructure as code comes from. Um, first one, don't use updated tutorials or documentation. This may sound obvious, but Terraform recently had syntactical changes between minor version updates. And keep in mind that the Terraform snippets you, you'll find online or on Stack Overflow may be in, invalid uh, with the re re most recent versions due to uh, recent changes. Uh, file and directory structure. Do your research for skeleton directory structures or templates that will give you the flexibility for growing your infrastructure over time without having to go through a restructure which can cause headaches when working alongside other engineers on the same infrastructure as code code base. State sharing. This is specifically for Terraform. Be sure to use their SaaS offering at terraform.io or use their AWS S3 backend to store and share Terraform's last known infrastructure snapshot. Um, integrate infrastructure as code with your continuous integration and continuous delivery systems. Unlock the power of, of, of infrastructure as code by tying it to your CI CD pipeline to connect infrastructure changes to application deployments. So that way your, your infrastructure remains in sync with your application. And if you do rollbacks of your application code, as necessary, the infrastructure, infrastructure can be rolled back to its previously uh, valid state for uh, that version of the code base of your application. Manage secrets from a single source of truth. Terraform can configure secret management services and it should be used as a, as a single source of truth defining your application secrets across environments. In addition, doing this greatly simplifies automatically rotating your infrastructure secrets. Use linters and other tools to validate your configuration. Linters can help you find bugs early, but it can also help you keep your configuration files consistent across your project. HashiCorp, the company behind Terraform, has a product called Sentinel. Sentinel is a framework for policy as code hash for HashiCorp enterprise products that allows you to define rules to validate your infrastructure. For example, Sentinel can review your AWS security groups and warn you if they are fully open to the public internet. And that is extremely powerful. And this concludes my presentation. I hope it helped you gain a better understanding of the purposes and benefits of infrastructure as code for cloud-based infrastructure. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So that was that was pretty good. I welcome everybody to turn their, their video feed and audio back on. Uh, virtual applause to everybody. I hope, hope you can hear all that thunderous <laughs> applause out there. All good stuff. I want to personally thank all of you for participating today on this. We're going to get to QA in one minute. I just, again, I just want to do a quick little thank you to the Pipeline Conference in general. This is a, a vision in a couple of people's minds some number of years ago. Uh, what if we could have a SIGGRAPH section where we just can talk about pipeline? And it was just sort of a dream that was realized by, I mean, just ridiculously hard work and, and just just time I know we don't have given the jobs we have <laughs> and inclusive with the speakers here. I, 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 I love sharing information as you guys know that know me. I love that everybody here has taken the time. Get that all down in 10 minutes. You guys all out there have to appreciate how hard that is. There's a lot of information to pack in. So a lot of time spent and it's everyone's, on behalf of everyone else, I appreciate your guys' time and energy and all of that. So let's get to some of these questions, just some good questions. This one I see a lot, almost every time I'm in a, a talk. And it's a good one, which is a lot of people want to get into this. They get excited about what they hear, everything that you guys are talking about. And I think it's basically, what are some examples of um, some Microsoft, uh, sorry, some microservices that you could build? I've got Azure and Amazon, everything in the brain now with cloud. Uh, what are some examples of microservices that you could build? Maybe as your first ones out, as sort of a trial run to get people feeling good about it, about you as a developer feeling good about it. What were some of your first outings in this world to help people out with what they could try? Um, I can go first. Uh, so if, so something simple like, um, so my first one was like a thumbnail service. Um, so all it did was like, you know, upload an image, uh, create a thumbnail that you, and then like gives you a thumbnail that you can use. Uh, something really simple. 
Uh, and then if you want to take a step further, maybe you add a component. So add like uh, an API for a database, for example. So just being able to query the database for basic, um, you know, just update, add, delete, that sort of stuff. Uh, it's probably a good place to start. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I'd, I'd say that um, your idea there of building something simple, but which is a stepping stone to building more complicated things around it uh, is a good place to start as well. So a thumbnail service, an asset resolver, a couple of things, and suddenly you've got yourself, uh, you know, an asset management system running in the cloud or, or whatever, um, something you can build on. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Also, if there's any smaller components of your existing um, stack that can be extracted to microservice, that's typically a great way to, to approach that problem because um, typically you come up with the understanding of how it works today. And the only challenge is really make transposing that into a microservice infrastructure while you already understand what needs to be done. So that simplifies the, um, the learning curve, but also it actually drives uh, real benefits because this is something that you wanted to extract from a monolithic application in the first place. I'll follow up with two. This is part of another question that that that's similar. Did you all do some of these first services just in a pure cloud environment, or did you do it with a private cloud at your own data center? In our case, uh, we had um, essentially started to microservice things on prem first, um, and the goal of that, in some ways, was exactly to prepare ourselves for a cloud transition, so that by the time we start moving to the cloud, we've got relatively simple, relatively independent components we can pick up and move. And otherwise you just find yourself having to disentangle your own code a whole bunch before you can even start dealing with cloud stuff. Um, at least if you do it that way, you can sort of separate those two efforts. Um, so the first time I started, I actually uh, used public cloud and just used like Google's container engine. Uh, it is an easier place to start if you're just building something outside of your studio infrastructure, if you're just building something like as a project. Uh, one, but then with, once I was within the studio infrastructure, there's obviously limitations. Um, you know, you, you don't have access to the internet if you're building a Docker image, like you have to think about all of these different things and it can add like a layer of complexity when you're deploying that you might not want to deal with as a beginner. Um, so I tried it just as is in the in the open world first, uh, uh, just to get an understanding of, of the various components and how things are, and then tried it within uh, the studio infrastructure. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I just, I'll just put that added note in there because I, I know how intimidating, I was I'll, I'll somewhat intimidated when I started with it because it's, it's a lot at once, but I will, I will also confirm that we, we started with a private cloud ourselves uh, and it's a safer way to kind of wait in. We did a lot of global library services, like a modeling shared service. So you could kind of share your stuff in a, an essential way. And that makes it a very complimentary piece as opposed to it's like jarred into your pipeline. So something like that, I think gives you like a little boost. I was gonna ask you just a, a, another question aside, because one thing that I've been challenged with, and I think others in the space initially is the socialization. And one of the presenters talked a little bit about it, but about the, trans, uh, about the transparency, Justin, but how, how hard has it been to uh, just, just both in your operations teams, your users involved? Is there, are people encouraged to go this direction? Are they afraid of it? Or what's the general reaction that you tend to get? In our experience, certainly, um, it feels like the, uh, there's been a bit of a shift in the last few years, which is the cloud is scary. You know, don't, your content can't go anywhere near the internet. Um, you know, security is, is terrible in the cloud. Oh my God, it's on the internet. How could it possibly be secure? The, real, the realization that actually, you know what, they've got a lot of people pretty heavily invested in security, focused on, on making the cloud secure. And of course you could use it wrong, but, um, uh, but I think that sort of, it's shifted from a, a sort of pure fear environment to actually know it's, uh, you know, there's advantages there for us. So uh, it's been really good to see. Yeah, I think uh, what, I, what I've been seeing is a lot of the reasons, you know, the, the fear and the, the why not reasons have kind of started to, to fade away as people feel more comfortable that, uh, you know, the cloud can give us more resilience and scale, which is something we really need uh, after, you know, getting through the pandemic. Um, and I think now it's people are moving to a phase of trying to figure out well, how to actually approach it, um, you know, in a, in a really kind of 
reasoned and um, you know thoughtful way. I, you know, I, I we found working building cloud services before the pandemic was was really difficult to even get the conversation started because uh, there was uh, you know often a lot of the objections were very you know very basic, and it was hard to get people to really um, kind of work through them. I have to think about cost differently. I have to think about security differently. I have to think about performance differently. But now I think everybody realizes that you know different is uh, is in the future. So there's more kind of embracing of change. And I think that's going to accelerate cloud adoption more than anything else is the change in, uh, in uh, the way we think about it, uh, because we, we know it's just going to lead to a better world. And we can't, we know we can't keep doing things the way we have been for the last little while. That, I think that's going to be the big, uh, the big, uh, you know, the linchpin. All right, let's, let's go to another question. This is, uh... This is one of the top ones as well, which is uh, how do you handle budgeting when cloud costs are so variable and seemingly complicated? And um, especially compared to the more hard costs for on-site hardware, basically your known costs, right? You have this sort of unknown out there of expense. How, how do you rein that in? Well, one thing, because um, this was really hot on um, Hacker News, I think in the last couple of days were Cloudflare wrote a piece about um, AWS egress costs. And I had this conversation as well with um, some customers. Um, so there's definitely all the cost model of all the stuff in the cloud that you have to think about. But one of the things that uh, for us as content creators uh, really stands out is that cloud providers let you put stuff into their cloud for free, but then they charge you to take it out. So if you've got uh, artists or teams working in, you know, on different cloud platforms, or even some, you know, some cloud providers charge for moving data between different data centers within their own cloud, or you're, you have people who are maybe like freelancers or you're bringing them into your studio for a temporary basis, you're gonna have to funnel tons of data, possibly even like huge pixel streams at high resolution with, you know, high color depth. Um, you know, that, that whole business model of uh, you know, egress being uh, data egress being a, a cost that's really high to cover, uh, you know, for the, the lock in so that you get economies when you're locked in and just operating within the cloud doesn't really work super well with our industry. And I think that's something that uh, is something to look at really carefully and not just as a, you know, a user of the cloud, but something for cloud providers to look at as well as they're designing systems to, to come into our market. Because I think that's kind of from a cost point of view, I think that's where there's one of the biggest, uh, you know, dissonances between how the cloud operates today versus what we really need to, uh, you know, put the money where it really matters to us. It shouldn't be on data egress. It should be on actually, uh, you know, blowing out compute and, you know, using machine learning models and horizontal scaling for interactive workloads and all the amazing things that could give artists superpowers versus being charged just to put pixels on their screen. Yeah, I'll give you a hear here on that. <laughs> I think uh, I'll speak for myself on this one, but I, I do think we're hybrid for a little while. I think a lot of companies have invested in some amount of hardware for themselves. And that was somewhat of a transitionary period to, 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 to get off of that and all the way into the cloud. And I, I just put that out there for anyone trying to wait in this world. You know, if, if you can go all the way in the cloud all at once and make a cost effective, I mean, that is the ultimate, in my opinion, the ultimate way to go. But I think realistically for a lot of bigger studios that have had investment in other things, more realistically, you kind of have to wait in. And anything that we do cost incentive wise to give, to give an ability to do that in a more cost, cost efficient way, the better. So any of the rest of you, uh, do you have a sort of tied down budget that you have to stick within or how are you monitoring that use? Um, Hopefully not a bill under the door at the end of the month, but do you have anything that <laughs> that you kind of track with that lets you kind of know where you're where you're at? I mean, uh, part of our sort of uh, well transparency approach has been to sort of hide the deployment of cloud resources in our our farm from artists, and uh, that allows that to be centrally managed. So our wranglers will be essentially just determining what what amount of cloud resource need to be spinned up. And that, that's easy for us at the moment because we really just are using cloud hybrid rendering and you know we, we don't have a huge cloud presence. But I'm really interested to see how things move forward because um, you know, our artists care a lot about render times, obviously because you know they don't want to use up a too big of a percentage of our on-prem farm. 
but that really changes when you start moving into the cloud and your resource pool becomes almost unlimited and it's a dollar question rather than a, a, an availability question you know you chuck that vendor on that's going to spend you know 20 hours of frame producing black frames all night and you know it's a bit of a bummer when it's when it's your on-prem farm but you know who knows maybe that farm was going to be idle anyway and you got away with it but if you see the real build for that like that that changes things you know that maybe that makes you more careful maybe it makes you more afraid uh, you know how is that going to affect your iteration on the one hand it's great to be able to throw a job on that might fail and if it fails that's okay you might learn something from that is it going to be as easy from a creative and sort of automation perspective to do that when there's such an obvious dollar cost associated with it? I'm, I'm really interested to see how that evolves in our industry. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, one thing I would also add, like to add is that uh, being on top of uh, all of your spends on the cloud, you know, knowing uh, the uh, Billing Explorer tools of AWS, GCP, Azure, and others uh, through and through is extremely valuable. Also having the means to audit, not only the resources that are used, but who use, uses them. Back to uh, Matthew's point, um, artists, they send their job and on Conductor, for example, they, they can request a four terabyte uh, mach machine with four terabytes of RAM. Uh, that's gonna be great. Their job's gonna go run fast, but it's, it's gonna be expensive. Um, and um, yeah, ultimately those tools need to be in place so that when artists are the prime or education is a problem that the studios have a way to uh, make sure that they you know the, the bad actors uh, on a studio who are uh, creating those uh, surges in, in uh, usage are, you know, understand how um, they should approach this problem differently. And, you know, maybe uh, using tiling, for example, so you can spread out, you know, uh, different uh, parts of your frame onto multiple machines. So you don't have to use super beefy machines, but you can just use uh, machines with less CPU, less CPU cores or RAM and essentially just stitch everything together back. So that way you can actually get your renders faster because everything happens in parallel and you don't have to deal with resource uh, exhaustion due to the beefy machines are, that tend to be hard to, to get, especially for a long period of time. Um, other things to keep in mind, like Matsu mentioned, understanding the different uh, costs that can happen on the cloud. It's, it's more complex than just uploading data. There's egress charges between regions. Um, if you move data across continents, it's gonna cost you a fortune. You need, you need to be aware of those things when you design your systems so you don't get um, surprised with a bill at the end of the month. So we've got two minutes left. I, we have one more question here that I think would be a good one to try. I don't know if this can be done in two minutes, but we'll try. Um, is it possible to elaborate on some of the issues and solutions related to storage? in the pipeline. You know, we had heard a little bit about object storage, sort of the need of it, but does that really work? And then what are alternative ways of providing storage to applications and users in a, in a cloud environment that's worked for you guys? That's actually something that um, I've spent a lot of time on um, because at Conductor, we are, we're not a studio. We essentially are um, a service that thousands of studios use. So ultimately we, we, we need to have one solution that suits all, right? We cannot have one solution that works for one customer of a given size. It needs to work for everybody. And um, in that light, what really worked for us is uh, using the multiple tiers of, of storage, like Metsu mentioned in his presentation. Uh, you know, object storage is the cheapest you can get. There's different tiers within, within object storage, depending on the cloud provider. It can even bring the cost uh, even lower. However, there's uh, you know there's trade-off. Uh, for example, you cannot pull the files. You cannot download them you know as fast as you would otherwise. Things like that. Um, so you need to be mindful of that. But also, ultimately, the cloud is meant to be. Um, use just in time you, you're supposed to pay for what you use when you when you need it you're not supposed to be leaving file servers running 24 7 right so if you are able to design actually you should be designing systems that are reactive and uh, you know that shut down completely and destroy all of their infrastructure when you're done with them as much as possible so you can keep the cost under control you, you don't have to you don't end up with uh, you know smart small parts of your infrastructure that is never used, but it's just still there and you're still paying for it you know, years down the road. So it's important to, to be aware of, of um, all the, uh, the different primitives in, in, in the cloud provider and, and how they can affect the, the performance, but also the, uh, you know, the, the cost. And, um, Doug, you're, you're, you're familiar with the, the refrain I have around storage is, you know, in order to, in order to um, have the intelligence required to move storage between tiers, um, you know, you need to know what what you need to move to what tier, 
which really like you, you got to work backwards from what is the artist trying to do and why and with what. So you have to have that referential integrity built into your pipeline to start. And then if you don't have that referential integrity, you know, like Justin mentioned, you know, uh, you know don't point at raw files or, you know, like have some kind of resolver or, you know, a system that gives you a chance to build referential integrity so you can then go and have a chance in your storage tiering system to optimize for cost performance trade-offs uh, and get the right thing to the right people with the right workload. Uh, but it really starts with how you're uh, looking at your data sets and how you model them around tasks and contexts. I think we lose sight of that a lot. We get really you know, hot on the technology and we just sort of think like, oh, we can throw network storage and you know, uh, substitute that for this, this cloud thing. But I think that really loses sight of the fact that unless there's a, a lot of discipline around referential integrity, you're never going to get through the cost, security, and performance problems that come with storage, which are, uh, you know, which which you can hit pretty quickly and and end up realizing they're much bigger than you had originally anticipated. Hundred percent agree. If, if it gives anyone any hope that that the problem set where we've gone to and from, uh, just my own personal experience is think about like the way you share your music or movies these days. You're not CDing around a file system for that stuff. And, and, and I know that's where people I worked with wanted to start. We are now in that awesome place of, no, I want to find it through metadata ways and the ways I, I noticed. And that's encouraging. I think that is, I agree with that's where we're going to go. So we are out of time. Again, thank you to all the presenters, all really great topics, all really great people in the community. And thank you to the Pipeline Conference. And um, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.